darkness holds, save where the beetle wheels his droning flight, and drowsy tinklings lull the distant foe. Save that from yonder ivy mantle tower, the moping owl does to the moon complain of such as wandering near her secret bower molest her ancient solitary reign. Collins had caught it in the ode to evening. Then lead calm votress where some sheety lake cheers the lone heath or some time-hallowed pile or upland fallows grey reflect its last cool gleam. One of Gainsborough's misty late landscapes here enacting the ode. But when chill blustering winds or driving rain forbid my willing feet, be mine the heart that from the mountain's side views wilds and swelling floods and hamlets brown and dim discovered spires and hears their simple bell and marks o'er all. Thy dewy fingers draw the gradual dusky veil. Winkleman's Greek mode become the people's mode of feeling and natural earth, the romantic classicism of Goethe's Hermann und Dorothea, or of Wordsworth's appeal to rustic life and the language of man. by which Cartesian reason turned to deistic clockwork and courtly pose unseats itself and points to the intuitive successor, an action opened by Barclay and climaxed by Kant, swift near the beginning where reason drives the man mad, pain toward the end, man for an age of reason. In that scrimmage under the polite surface of the world, the roofed unconscious of Blake's creative hell where Haydn was revitalizing the fugue as a ground of struggle, and George Stubbs, 1769, lion devouring a horse, turned animal realism to savage symbol. There, everything splits from itself and fights on both sides. Sam Johnson in midstream holds the fort of mind in the knowledge of its own and the world's vanity, sustained by a promise which faith could only credit, reason not confirm. Of course, he condemns all romantic and Rousseauian innovators. Truth, sir, is a cow which will give such fellows no more milk. Sir, they are gone to milk the bull. Yet his immortal letter to Chesterfield is, under its formal robes, the most independent outbreak in the language. Seven years, my lord, have now passed since I waited in your outward rooms or was repulsed from your door, during which time I have been pushing on my work through difficulties of which it is useless to complain, and have brought it at last to the verge of publication without one act of assistance, one word of encouragement, or one smile of favour. 
The notice which you have been pleased to take of my labours, had it been early, had been kind, but it has been delayed till I am indifferent and cannot enjoy it, till I am solitary and cannot impart it, till I am known and do not want it. Having carried on my work thus far, with so little obligation to any favourer of learning, I shall not be disappointed, though I should conclude it, if less be possible, with less. For I have been long wakened from that dream of hope, in which I once boasted myself, with so much exaltation, my lord, your lordship's most humble, most obedient servant, Sam Johnson. In Johnson's circle, Goldsmith published The Vicar of Wakefield in 1766, a novel which took Europe, most of all Goethe's Germany, by storm. Here, the plot in the grand manner, where good, ensnared by hypocrisy and evil, until the world seems such a veil of dark that only the old appeal beyond time will serve, is suddenly delivered to the vindication of this best of all possible worlds. That baroque cadence is here stretched to the limit. Within its Leibnizian action, the vicar and all his family, delivered from prison and oppression, become homespun models of truth and sensibility, calling mannered Europe to such values as Greuze, taking the pulse of his aristocratic clientele, would enshrine eight years later in his picture of the Twelfth Cake, almost a pastiche of Goldsmith. In the attempt to recover simplicity in an age of social artifice and irony, only fierce genius can avoid the mawkishness of Greuze, those crouching babes at morning prayers, that pitcher broken on the spouting phallic lion. So what could we expect of poor George Morland, who wrote his own epitaph, Here Lies a Drunken Dog? He was sold too short to give even his boozing scenes the brewer force of Burns, a merry core of randy gangrel bodies in poozy nancies held the splore to drink their aura duddies. What then, when even Burns in the cotter's Saturday night slips to the tearful verge? At length his lonely cot appears in view beneath the shelter of an aged tree. The expectant wee things toddlin stacher through to meet their dad with flichter and noise and glee. His wee bit ingle, blinkin bonny lee, his clean hearth stain, his thrifty wifey's smile, the lispin infant prattlin on his knee, does ah his weary care and care beguile, and makes him quite forget his labour and his toil. No social painter of England rose, as Goya did, from courtly praise, this Gainsborough, Lady Dunscombe, through such irony as Rowlandson's, to revolutionary vision, as in Blake. If mockery lurks under these robes and studio props, it is not overt, nor would the sitter have claimed the resemblance to Lady Teasel in Sheridan's School for Scandal of the same year the hypocrite Joseph Surface seducing her. Ah, my dear madam, tis this very conscious innocence that is of the greatest prejudice to you. What makes you run into a thousand little imprudences? Why, the consciousness of your own innocence, Lady Teasel. So, then, I must sin in my own defence, and part with my virtue to secure my reputation? though even in Sheridan mockery yields to the handled cadence of vice discomfited and virtue wed. It would cost the next century a groaning to cast that heroic baggage. Yet in the Frick Gallery there is a room where one may take in, at a glance, Gainsborough's optimism of limitation, and on the other wall the sensuous vulnerability of Lawrence's Julia, Lady Peel, right for Scott's Bride of Lammermoor, for the Brontes, Jane Eyre, and Wuthering Heights, Hardy's Tess, or in the return of the native Eustatia Vi. The eighteenth century, by the lure of Voltaire's smile, prone to an infection of heart. In Venice, the seventy-year-old Guardi shows us a gas balloon rising over the Judecca Canal while the beau monde of what was already revolutionary Europe look on, 
though dressed still in the manner of court, like Goethe and Beethoven, when they met the noble party, and Goethe bowed and stepped down. Through the play of fashion, some defiant giant release is stirring, as from deep in the mineral veins of earth, proud Beethoven walked on. But it was Goethe's Mephisto who had said, this puff of hydrogen will do it, and they were lifted into the air. For the taste of progress, go back 400 years. The Doge's Palace, Trecento in style, though 1424 and after, with the Ars Nova Gloria of Matteo da Perugia, Italian late Gothic, a style like the Rococo of cunning complexity. Yet how stripped to line and structure How clean of wishful personality. In the symbolic Florence of this Spanish chapel allegory of the church, humanity, as in Chaucer, is keenly emergent. No pompous, all is best. No sentimental longing. The Annunciation, in this initial from a choir book, is as reconciled in all the flair of its decoration to its creed-given spacelessness as the faces to their vacancy or music to its bare fifth intervals. In the French Rococo Salon, the civilized recess is as ornately, as formulably filled as the time-space fabric of material causality, or under the inventive floriation of recorder delight, the harmonic assertions of the enlightened ground. tapestries of country pastimes, our very picnic clownings, our ironies of wit, affirm the plenum of the ordered universe. All is best, best, best. But that completion and closure of the phenomenal, that rounding of the wheel, summons the old antagonist against the dream of methodic science, that though men, even scientists, may fall in love, despair, kill themselves, or like Pascal, get religion, still the great tree of knowledge grows. Comes a hiss from that very tree. The fruit of science is death. What is the age of reason giving birth to but its own antithesis? But when, with right of Derby, 1774, the skeleton appears in the crumbling garden, it is no backward motion. The old dance of death was painted on church walls, rest of their bones and souls delivery. It is upon energy now, where all action has reared its eternal claim, that the withering of entropy will fall. Carnot's irreversibility of the physical. Blake, the same dull round even of a universe, would soon become a mill with complicated wheels. (laughs) 
1800. A final overflow of the post-Newtonian century, the famous passage from Laplace with a Viennese astronomical clock. If an intelligence for one given instant recognizes all the forces which animate nature and the respective positions of the things which compose it, and if that intelligence is also sufficiently vast to subject these data to analysis, it will comprehend in one formula the movements of the largest bodies of the universe as well as those of the minutest atom. Nothing will be incertain to it, and the future as well as the past will be present to its vision. The human mind offers in the perfection which it has been able to give to astronomy a modest example of such an intelligence. It is what Whitehead, after Faraday's fields, had finally led to indeterminacy, would call misplaced concreteness. Against the tick of that astronomical clock, against motion's subsiding pool, Blake, from the 1790s, had raised the sun of morning from the only axiomatic source of life as unpredictable, creative paradox. Without contraries, there is no progression. What the religious call evil is the active springing from energy. Energy is eternal delight. And when his arm spread day shades into loss at the forge of imagination, sheathed in the battle files of energy's operation in the inertial world, however many thereafter might espouse with conservative Burke the propriety and balance of an old regime. Blake, through reign of terror and the dragon scaling of the orc cycle, would still affirm, bring me my bow of burning gold, bring me my arrows of desire. For Gluck, as for Blake's repudiated Swedenborg, hell's dissonant outbreak, is to be calmed by successive applications of Orphic harmony. How radically Blake's marriage of heaven and hell has broken with that conformity. Is it in Mozart, or first with Beethoven, that music espouses the Faust compact, Hegel's passion, the Dionysiac cry of Holderlin? The rescuer I hear then in the night, hear him kill as he frees, and beneath, full of fetid weeds, I see the earth as by second sight, an enormous fire, schau ich die Erde, ein gewaltig Feuer. In France, the ferment had been rising since the 1762 publication of Rousseau's Social Contract. When each citizen is nothing and can do nothing without the rest, it may be said that legislation is at the highest possible point of perfection. An absolute moral law of the cloud-wrapped general will. In the representations, which from about 1783 David gave to classical scenes of heroism or revolt, tight as if Cartesian formulation could be re-endowed by Fayette, we feel the closing in of that republic of virtue. Robespierre, if virtue be the spring of a popular government in times of peace, the spring of that government during a revolution is virtue combined with terror without which virtue is impotent. Babeuf, a single man on the earth, more rich, more powerful than his fellow men, destroys the equilibrium. Perish, if needs be, all the arts, provided real equality abides with us. In 1794, David, briefly imprisoned, painted this baffled self-portrait. Perhaps he felt with Chénier in La Jeune Captive, and even as she, those with her in that place, feared the closing of their earthly course, though Chénier's death testament would not apply. A certain André Chénier was among those five or six whom neither the general frenzy nor avidity nor fear could induce to bend the knee before crowned assassins, to touch hands stained by murders, and to sit down to a table where they drink human blood, s'asseoir à la table où l'on boit le sang des hommes since David came quickly to terms and would again as Napoleon's court painter. A 
Only the genius of Goya could wear the richest robes of the artifice it was to revolutionize, making this parasol play of the 70s as poignant as the lighter Mozart, eine kleine Nachtmusik. By the mid-90s, Goya had loosed the furies we tie in music to Beethoven. Though Mozart too, in some late works, this G minor symphony of 1788 rode the rising storm. While Gauss, discovering Euclid's space of the parallel postulate, no more demonstrable than a curved space of hyperbolic asymptotes, wrote the elder Bolyai, if it could be proved that there can be a rectilineal triangle greater than any area, I could demonstrate the whole of Euclid. But however far apart the vertices, the area might fall below a given bound. A Labashevskian gulf from which that Bolyai would vainly warn his son. I have traversed this bottomless night which extinguished all light and joy of my life. I pray you, leave the science of parallels alone. By 1800, Beethoven had not only written the first symphony, the first concerto, the first string quartets, and the Prometheus Overture, but the Grande Sonata Pathétique, which so overwhelmed his contemporaries. Canova, 1797, answering from Italy the muster of a revolutionary art in almost every country of Europe. In 1796, the German romantic landscape begins with this Koch, the human figure right, reduced from the shepherd below to an insect-sized being above. The sublime had appeared in Edmund Burke as a transrational element, born in pain of the great, dark, and terrible yet somehow stronger than its smooth contrary, the beautiful, founded on pleasure, engendering in the soul that feeling which is called love. It is the germ of Blake's angelic and satanic, of Nietzsche's Apollonian and Dionysian, and what the transition of 1800 would require is the leap from calm balance to the cascade of energy. In Kant, the sublime almost but never quite becomes the pedal point of such a modulation. The mind feels itself set in motion in the representation of the sublime in nature, whereas in the aesthetic judgment upon what is beautiful therein, it is in restful contemplation. This movement may be compared with a rapidly alternating repulsion and attraction produced by one and the same object. Beethoven's Pathetic Adagio and Turner's Moonlight, a study, 1797. However few were aware, matter in motion was giving ground. 
What was emergent from Galvani's electricity and muscle response, Goethe's metamorphosis of plants, or evolution from the older Darwin to volitional Lamarck requires what Whitehead would call entwined modal presences. Faraday, 1854. My physico-hypothetical notion, accepting the magnet as a center of power surrounded by lines of force, views these lines as physical lines of power or as a state of tension. Things dissolving to force fields as under Turner's moon. In 1799, the German painter Runger made this glowing crayon of himself. It is not that Baroque confidence has gone under. Wordsworth is at least as certain as Dryden, Beethoven as rapt as Buxtehude. The constructions of space and cause, art, harmony, plot are retained. That trio of schoolmates, Hegel, Hölderlin, Schelling, are no less fired with God in the world than Leibniz was. But there has been a shift of ground. Hegel might frown if we said, Voltaire and Rousseau have led you through the scoff of reason to the trust of heart, since Hegel calls his history reason's actualization in the world. If we protest, but your reason makes war on itself, works by passion, you forge a dialectic of contradiction. How easy for him to remind us that Leibniz, complex as the Solimena of this 1710 self-portrait, had planted contradiction in the very monad, making a multiplicity of change in that changeless one the primary fact of perception. The passing condition, which involves and represents a multiplicity in the unity, or in the simple substance, is nothing else than what is called perception. Both Leibniz and Hegel soar to giant syntheses. How could they, as men, but use what men have, reason, passion, intuition? Yet those seemingly constant words, man, reason, and the rest, also undergo style changes. Solimena's formulated claim, undercut by protective irony, yields in Runga to the risk of romantic dreams though even the dream takes up the program of the past. Was Voltaire?